Robert Reynolds Journalism Institute at the University of Missouri. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. In three months, the world will descend on Brazil for the 2016 Summer Olympics. But right now, Brazil's world appears to be falling apart. As we tape this program, the country's Senate is on course to begin an impeachment trial against President Dilma Rousseff. Brazil's first female president is being charged with breaking fiscal laws by manipulating the country's budget numbers ahead of the last election to hide the scale of its debts. Meanwhile, Brazil's top prosecutor has asked for permission to investigate Rousseff for obstructing an investigation into a huge corruption scandal at the state-run oil company, Petrobras. That scandal has already embroiled dozens of legislators, including many senior members from Rousseff's ruling Workers' Party. Rousseff has called the impeachment proceedings against her a coup d'etat. She says she's being impeached for political reasons, not for any crimes. All this comes as Brazil's once booming economy has tipped into recession, and the Olympics is facing bad publicity over environmental problems in Rio de Janeiro and fears over the spread of Zika virus. On this edition of Global Journalist, a look at the political crisis in the world's fifth most populous country. Joining us right now from Rio de Janeiro is Andrew Fishman, a reporter for The Intercept. Andrew, welcome to Global Journalist. Thanks for having me. Remind us, if you would, about President Rousseff's Workers' Party. They have been in power for some time. What have they done to change Brazil? So the Workers' Party has won four straight elections uh, for four-year terms. Uh, Dilma, President Dilma succeeded uh, Lula da Silva, who was one of the co-founders of the Workers' Party. Um, he lost three straight elections right after the, the end of the military regime here. And on a much more far-left platform, on his fourth round, he sort of moderated his, his more leftist policies and made them more, more uh, corporate-friendly, made some more co compromises, more... Um, and, and that allowed the, the electorate to accept him. He was overwhelmingly elected. He was overwhelmingly reelected again. Uh, the base of their, of their platform is um, social programs, social spendings like Bolsa Familia, um, which gave uh, direct cash transfers to the poorest citizens. Also, Mia Casa Mia Vida, which, which built houses for, um, for large numbers of, of people and a lot of investment in infrastructure in the rural Northeast that previously had not seen a lot of uh, government investment there. Also, the part of the, the side where they moderated their positions, where they, they gave huge um, benefits and, and uh, loans to the major construction firms and other big industry, hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Um, which is actually kind of gets to the root of the current corruption struggles that we're seeing now. Well, before we get to that, tell us, if you would, about Brazil's economy over the last 10 to 15 years, because it sounds like it's been in sort of a boom-bust cycle. Yeah, under the Lula years, in the beginning of the Dilma years, uh, Brazil was seeing incredible growth, um, huge expansion in the, in the middle class, and also they uh, found these massive uh, offshore oil reserves and everything seemed like it was just going perfectly. Nothing could go wrong um, underneath that. But that was that was part of a you know the, the rise in the um, global oil prices and the commodities boom nationwide fueled by China. Once China started to slow down, then Brazil, who has a large portion of their GDP is dependent on exports, their economy started to drop as well under towards the end of Dilma's second year. And since then, they're seeing a huge recession, um, massive uh, unemployment rate spiking. The economy, the um, the currency has tanked the how, and right now, when previously Lula was was benefiting from this this global rise in the economy, and of course the president of all countries always received the the um, praise for when when the global economy is going well, and now right now Dilma is seeing the the brunt of the global economic downturn going against her, in addition to her own policies, which, which exacerbated the current situation. And President Rousseff looks set to face trial in the Senate on impeachment charges. She and her supporters are calling this a coup d'etat. Why, why is that? They're calling it a coup d'etat because the, the line is that while they're following uh, judicial procedures, such as you know, it's going through the, the House and it's going through the Senate, and they're, they're using a, an impeachment vote uh, just as is available in all parliamentary uh, presidential systems. Uh, she says that the, the grounds for impeachment are not there. It's not a high crime or misdemeanor, which is the bar for, uh, for an impeachment vote, and therefore it's being conducted extrajudicially. Um, a lot of jurists agree with her, um, as do many other 
um, outside observers, um, not necessarily that it's a coup, they say that it's, it's anti-democratic and there's no legal basis for, for impeachment, including the economist, UNISUR, um, the OAS, the Organization of American States, um, and many others. And at the basis of this are the accusations that she manipulated the budget numbers before the 2014 elections to sort of make them look more rosy than they really were. Correct. It's the, the accuser of fiscal manipulations that they passed. They made certain banks that are controlled by the state uh, pay for certain programs to just temporarily, since the government couldn't cover cover the uh, couldn't cover the payments at the time. All the money was paid back eventually, though, and it's similar to what President Obama did during the fiscal cliff in the United States, if you remember, to to keep the government going for a few months while they were waiting for the money to happen, although this was done at a much larger scale, and, what, and much larger scale than previous presidents have done. Well, what do we know about her vice president, Michel Temer? He is looks set to take over if uh, President Rousseff is suspended and put on trial. What's his background? Yeah, Brazil has a, um, has a coalition system, which is very different for an American observer looking at our two-party system. So here, President Michel Temer is not actually from the same party as, Dil as Dilma Rousseff, which, is, which makes the dynamics much more interesting. Um, he comes from the PMDB, which is this, uh, it was previously the party that was against the, the dictatorship, but has made, become this you know, middle-of-the-road dealmaker party that really has no central ideology other than maintaining power. Uh, Temer comes from a much further right-wing uh, point of view than, than President Rousseff does. And in his, since he's been, Dilma has accused him of being uh, a conspirator, a, a usurper of her power. Uh, they do not have a very good relationship. And some of the proposals that he's been putting out or floating or allies have been floating um, push to a much more neoliberal agenda, um, a lot of, of cuts, austerity, um, and they've gotten a lot of pushback because of that. And uh, Dilma herself has criticized these. And Andrew, our time does grow short. What about how the media in Brazil has covered this? How have the big TV networks covered the impeachment proceedings against her? Yeah, Brazil has a very concentrated media in the hands of a few families, very rich families that have been there. They've, they've all supported the, the dictatorship since 64 and the, the coup in 64. They were pushing this line against, against Dilma's presidency. They were the, the main drivers, one of the main drivers. To, to discredit her and Lula and to make this impeachment vote go forward. And right around March, it started to become very clear to outside observers exactly their role and what was happening. And since then, they've, they've been getting a lot of criticism and they've also been getting a lot of pushback on social media in Brazil. And there have been huge protests against Globo, the main, the main broadcaster. Andrew Fishman, thanks so much for coming on Global Journalist. Thank you. I want to remind our listeners today we're talking about the political crisis in Brazil ahead of the Summer Olympics. To broaden our discussion now, we're going to bring in three more experts to give us their read on the situation. Joining us from London is Anthony Pereira, a professor and director of the Brazil Institute at King's College. From New York, James Naylor Green, professor of Brazilian history and culture at Brown University. And from Rio, Will Carlos, a senior correspondent for Global Post, a Boston-based digital news agency. Welcome to all of you. James Green, I want to start with you. I understand you've organized a group of American and international academics who have signed an open letter saying that the current impeachment proceedings threaten to undermine Brazil's democracy. Tell us why. Well, the process of the impeachment has been flawed, I think, from the very beginning, including ways in which the media has been mentioned before, has manipulated public opinion uh, to create a climate uh, against the president. Um, the procedure within the House, um, I think, it had in its charges elements and information that was not pertinent to the charge of crimes or responsibilities for uh, budget manipulation. And the ways in which uh, different actors have presented themselves and participated in this process really threatens the fact that the president had been elected with 54 million votes uh, this is a process to undermine her uh, legitimate election uh, in 2014 and uh, to me is a very serious and to the many uh, people who signed our petition a very serious threat to democracy. Anthony Pereira, James Green sees it as undermining the results of the last election. Do you see things the same way? I, I agree with Jim up to a point. I do think though that the supporters of Jilma Rousseff tactically made a mistake by calling the impeachment a coup. 
Uh, I think the problem with this is the PT itself voted to impeach President Collier de Mello in 1992, and it's 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 stretching the argument. If you notice, the international press doesn't really go along with this idea that it's a coup. Uh, Gilmer herself, when she recently spoke at the UN, avoided using the term coup. And in fact, Andrew mentioned that there's sympathy in the multilaterals for Gilmer's position, but there is no sympathy for the idea that this is a coup and that, and that Brazil has to be suspended from the Mercosur or the OAS or UNASUR because of what's happening. I think, unfortunately, the coup language, which is fine for mobilizing the base, uh, distracts from the argument that Jim is talking about, which is that the arguments about fiscal manipulation are quite weak and very, very unfairly uh, applied in this case. Other presidents, other governors have done similar things, although not to the scale uh, that Jilma has. Um, and if, even if you accept the argument that this is a crime of responsibility, which I don't, uh, the, great inc the, the great paradox is that Michel Temer, who's poised to assume the presidency, if the Senate votes to try Gilma for impeachment, he himself signed these same kind of documents. So he's responsible for the same fiscal uh, manipulation. So I think there's a very strong argument there that's been diluted by this overreaction on the part of supporters of Gilma Rousseff to say that it's a coup. It's, it's not a coup and it's not going to be accepted as a coup in any of the multilateral institutions in the region. And Will Carlos, Dilma is being, uh, does face impeachment proceedings on this uh, alleged crime of fiscal manipulation, but there is this really big corruption investigation into contracts surrounding Petrobras, which is a little bit separate here. Tell us about that investigation and how that's sort of affecting the overall atmosphere in, in Brazil now. Well, yeah, you make, you make a good point. And I mean, I think if we, one of the things you, your guests haven't touched on yet is if we, if we zoom out a little bit and we look at this, I mean, yes, there is the, the sort of the official reason for, uh, for the impeachment, which are these crimes of responsibility. And we can argue whether or not they were serious enough or whether or not that's a legitimate basis uh, for her impeachment. But the bigger picture here is that there's, there's massive dissatisfaction with Dilma Rousseff and with the, the economy, with uh, this, this huge dissatisfaction with politicians in general. And in fact, if you talk to people, both supporters of Dilma Rousseff and people who have been pushing for her impeachment, most people you talk to in Brazil want to sort of boot everybody out. I mean, they're, they're fed up of corruption. They, they believe that, that politicians are, are all on the take and are all crooked. Uh, I, I, you won't, I don't think you'll find a country where people dislike their politicians, or you'd be hard pushed to find a country where people dislike their politicians as much as Brazil. And so that's the sort of the broader political context here. Um, there, there is so much corruption. The, the Petrobras scandal that you touched on was just extraordinary in its scale, and it's had a huge impact on the economy. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that were skimmed off uh, government contracts and then made their way back into the coffers of the ruling party and other parties. So uh, Brazilians have got good reason to be very upset at their politicians and it's sort of coming out, I think it's fair to say, in this impeachment. One last point that's very important is that uh, whereas scores of these politicians have, or I think dozens of these politicians have been connected with the Petrobras scandal and have been accused of personal enrichment. Ironically, Dilma Rousseff has not. And, and what she's accused of, I think most people would agree, is actually uh, whether she's guilty of it or not is, is, is on, a, on a far smaller scale and sort of less, uh, less distasteful than, than what a lot of people in Brazil's, uh, in Brazil's, uh, you know, a lot of Brazilian Brazil's ruling politicians have been accused of actually gaining personally enriching themselves from corruption. Well, let me turn that to James Green then uh, on this issue of this massive corruption inquiry. I read in the Toronto Globe and Mail something like 60 percent of Brazil's legislators are under investigation or under indictment now for corruption. How is it that this problem grew so massively? Well, there's been a tradition of corruption in Brazil, I would argue, since the Portuguese arrived in 1500. It was embedded in the colonial system, and it's continued to the 20th century. And most politicians understand that one of the advantages of being in office is having direct access to government monies and to be able to use them for personal gain. Uh, what is disheartening about the corruption investigations is all, although they are jailing some very important contractors, the largest contractors in the country, uh, the attention has been mostly against 
uh, the Workers' Party and the government in power, and much less against the opposition. And I would speculate that uh, when the dust settles and the impeachment uh, comes to a conclusion, whether it's positive or negative, most of those investigations against other political parties, that is the ones who may come to power, will be uh, put in the drawer, will be a uh, table, will not be uh, looked at. Because this has been business as usual for many years, and although many, many millions of people are against corruption, uh, there is no indication that there is going to be a serious routing out of this practice uh, throughout the uh, political system. Well, Anthony Pereira, I want to pick up on that point. Uh, at one point, President Obama had re referred to President Rousseff's predecessor, uh, President Lula, as the most popular politician on earth. Where is he now in this investigation? Because he did face charges at one point. Yes, I believe a prosecutor in the state of Sao Paulo, the Ministerio Público of the state of Sao Paulo, uh, tried to, to bring charges against Lula. I don't think they've yet been taken up by a judge. But he was coercively interrogated um, by the federal police on the orders of Sergio Moro, the federal judge in uh, Curitiba. Um, so I think Lula's popularity has been dented. I mean, it's gone down. The negatives, uh, his rejection rate has gone up. Um, he's still a popular politician. If you look at the projections for if there were election today, who would be the most popular candidates? That, that's Lula and Marina Silva, who also ran in 2014. But they're, you know, 20, 21 percent. So Lula's popularity has been dented, but I think he still believes that he could be a candidate in 2018. He hasn't formally been charged yet, although he's been uh, investigated both for a beachfront property in Guarujá and a, a, uh, a farm. Um, but um, uh, I would say that Lula is still there as a candidate, as a potential candidate for the 2018 elections. And in fact, in some ways, it's better for him as a potential candidate if Jilma ends up leaving, either, either resigning or end up being impeached. It would allow him to run as, uh, a, as an opponent of a Michel Temer government. Uh, he wouldn't be responsible for the economy. And I, you know, I, paradoxically, I'm not saying he's trying to achieve this. I'm just saying that he would probably uh, benefit as a candidate um, if the Jilma presidency came to an end. A reminder that this is Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. This week, a look at Brazil's political and economic crises ahead of the Summer Olympics in Rio. Our guest this week from London, Anthony Pereira, director of the Brazil Institute at King's College London. From New York, James Naylor Green, professor of Brazilian history at Brown University. And from Rio de Janeiro, Will Carlos, a senior correspondent for Global Post. If you're interested in more Global Journalist content, visit us online at globaljournalist.org. There you can read our ongoing series of interviews with journalists in exile around the world in coverage of foreign affairs and press freedom issues. We're also on social media. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Global Journ. Will Carlos, you're in Rio right now. As you go around and talk to sort of ordinary Brazilians, what is their feeling about this political crisis right now? How, 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 how do ordinary people in the street view things? I mean, it really depends who you ask. I mean, one thing that, that's become very apparent is, I, I guess, much like the United States, Brazil is extremely divided right now on this issue of impeachment. Um, you, you certainly have a very vocal, uh, you have very vo vocal groups on both sides, on, on both sides. But as I said earlier, yeah, I mean, the vast majority of Brazilians, I mean, almost everybody that I talk to, and I talk to a lot of people in Brazil, almost everyone you talk to from all, uh, from all parts of society, all walks of life, is of the opinion that there really just needs to be a sort of cleaning of the house and that they need to uh, sort, of, sort of rake out the bad guys and start again. The problem with that is that Brazil, A, doesn't, doesn't really have a mechanism for doing that. Uh, I mean, there could possibly be early elections called, but nobody thinks that that's very likely. Secondly, the way that Brazilian politics is set up, it's very difficult for politicians to sort of gain re name recognition. Andrew Fishman mentioned earlier, we don't have a, a two-party system like in, in the United States, so you don't have a sort of a, a party that, you, that, you can, uh, that, that can help you come to power. You kind of have to raise money on your own, and that unfortunately means that there's a lot of festering corruption here. So uh, even if you sort of clear out the, the, 
the vagabundos, you know, you get rid of the bad guys, the ladrones, and start again, uh, you're just going to probably attract a whole bunch more bad guys who, who are interested in, in, in getting themselves rich. So, but yeah, I mean, the feeling on the street here is just disenchantment, uh, just uh, utter a lot of confusion, a lot of frustration, and a lot of people who just, uh, you know, sort of wish things were better and are just trying to get on with their daily lives and, and hoping that, that, that somebody figures this out and that, that things improve. And James Green, the opening ceremonies for the Summer Olympics are just three months away. There is this prospect that the president could be facing an impeachment trial during the, during the Summer Games. How, how do you see that sort of the big political soap opera that's taking place right now will affect this big event scheduled to, to open in Brazil? I think it's going to have actually very little effect. People were predicting there would be a disaster in the World Cup of uh, 2014, and there really wasn't. I don't think there will be serious logistical problems with the Olympics. Uh, if President Rousseffi is not presiding, it will be the vice president. I predict some people will boo him, others will applaud him. But the, the crisis is different from the Olympics. I think it really has to do with, as has been pointed out, a deep distrust of the political system by the vast majority of the population. Uh, with no end in sight, because it's very important to keep in mind that if the vice president assumes power, he probably will be carrying out the program of the opposition that lost the election, which is to cut back on social programs and really um, roll back the programs, the social programs that were uh, developed under the Lula and Juma uh, administrations. This will provoke serious discontent among the population, and I think they'll be waking up to a realization that the uh, current government has at least attempted much more than any other previous governments before Lula to really address the social uh, uh, and economic problems of the country that really affect the poor people d deeply. And Anthony Pereira, James Green did mention the World Cup in Brazil in 2014. Ahead of that World Cup, there were large street demonstrations uh, against some government policies. Then do you see that that could take place as well here in the next couple months ahead of the Summer Games? There could be protests. I think for the games themselves, the opportunities are going to be more limited than they were during the World Cup because the games, by and large, are happening just in Rio. I mean, there are a few football matches outside, but uh, and there are going to be a lot of um, security. It's going to be the army as well as the police, tens of thousands of of uh, security people in the streets. Um, but there could be protests in the short term. I'm not, I don't completely agree with Jim that this government will necessarily radically cut social programs. You've you got to remember that Bolsa Familia hasn't been updated in terms of its value since 2014. So it's already lost almost 20 percent of its real value under the Dilma Rousseff government. Uh, programs like Bolsa Familia are cheap. It's half of, of 1 percent of GDP. So I, I don't I expect a Temer government to to tamper with that right away. They could go, let the real value of it continue to fall as you have 10 percent inflation a year. But I do think that it goes beyond what we've been talking about up to now in terms of replacing corrupt politicians. I think there uh, is real hunger in Brazil for a debate about institutional reform of the whole system of representation. So you've already had a Supreme Court decision which has ruled that corporate donations to political candidates are now unconstitutional. Um, companies can still get around this by donating to parties rather than candidates. Um, but that expresses a desire, I think, to have a more transparent system of funding campaigns. And you may also have, as a result of this crisis, who knows, you might have a discussion of the whole issue of the size of the districts that members of Congress run in. They run in districts that are as large as the state that they run from. So in, in Sao Paulo, you're talking about an electorate of 35 million people, which makes campaigning very expensive and leads to temptations to indulge in illegal campaign finance. So I think this crisis, if there is a silver lining to it, it could be that it will spark the kind of debates in Brazil that have been put off for a long time about how to reform the system of representation so that it's more transparent and there's more accountability and you have less of this kind of systemic corruption that has been revealed by the car wash investigation and other, other of these investigations that we've been talking about. And Will, Carlos, here's how you opened a recent article about the Summer Games for Global Post. You, you wrote, come to Brazil, land of Zika, political chaos, spiking inflation, a plummeting economy, and riotous protests. So what's your take on how, how the games are going to come off? 
Uh, I, I think if it's going to have an impact, if all of this is going to have an impact, it's one of PR, it's one of confidence, it's one of, you know, really getting people to, to come to Rio. Um, there were reports last month that, that they've only sold less than half of the tickets for the games. Um, I, I think that there's a huge crisis of confidence. I actually have a story uh, this week about exactly that, about Rio's image problem uh, leading up to these games. But as your previous guest said, I think ultimately these are two separate things. The crisis that's going on in, in Brazilian politics is very is kind of very interesting to watch, but it's not going to have a direct impact on the Olympics, which are largely funded by uh, the state of Rio, which it could be added is is un undergoing its own massive financial crisis. It's basically broke, um, but it's separate to the federal government. The federal government doesn't really have a whole lot to do with the Olympics. Um, it's mainly the state and the city. What it does is is uh, you know it's this question of whether you can whether you can convince people to uh, kind of part with their hard earned dollars to to get on a flight. To a country that's that's undergoing so many uh, so many crises all at the same time. That's that's Brazil's challenge in the coming weeks. And James Green, back in the 1960s, there was a political crisis in Brazil, and the military seized power. What what has been the role of the military this time around? They have remained relatively silent. They haven't been actually needed, uh, in my opinion, to uh, intervene directly into this process. Um, politicians have found a way to. Uh, disrupt the political system on their own uh, without uh, calling the armed forces to play a role here. And I don't expect them to play an immediate role in this crisis. And with just a few moments left, Anthony Pereira, Brazil's next elections are in 2018. Where do you see that the country will be then? Well, just a proviso to that, there are municipal elections scheduled for this year. So October of 2016, we'll see municipal elections. And uh, they're often a very unreliable guide to presidential elections, but people will be reading the tea leaves of those to see, for example, how badly the PT does, how many seats it loses, whether it's able to hang on to any major cities. Um, but for 2018, I think it's a very unpredictable uh, scenario because um, you really don't even know who's going to be eligible to run at that point. For example, I mentioned Lula. Um, you know, he could be cast aside through some sort of judicial investigation. Um, and so it seems so far away now in, in where we are now, May of 2016, to be thinking about those presidential elections. I think it could actually be a wild card. People assume that because the axis of Brazilian politics has been between the PT, the Workers' Party, and the PSDB, the Social Democratic Party, for so long, that the PSDB is the heir apparent and the next president will come from that party when there are elections in 2018. I don't think that's necessarily the case. There's a lot of anti-incumbent feeling. PSDB politicians have been booed at some of these protests and you could get someone from right out of um, maybe from the center right or even from the right uh, sort of a populist candidate who comes in who none of us are really thinking about. We're going to have to leave it there for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the University of Missouri. Many thanks to Andrew Fishman, Anthony Pereira, James Naylor Green, and Will Carlos for joining us. For all of us here at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.